And joining us now, John Ralston Saul, author of A Fair Country, Telling Truths About Canada. You actually don't waste any time at all getting to the heart of the matter with the new ground that you hope to break in this book because the first sentence of chapter one is, we are a Métis civilization. And you go on to say, our institutions and common sense as a civilization are more Aboriginal than European or African or Asian, even though we have created elaborate theatrical screens of language, reference, and mythology to misrepresent ourselves to ourselves. This is a fascinating new thesis, and let's get into this. What do you think is hidden behind these, quote, elaborate theatrical screens? Can I do one thing, which is, uh, it, when I say we're a Métis civilization, it's small m. The Medi people, capital M, you know, that's a very real, concrete, legal thing. And so I'm not suggesting any, you know, interference with that. Even um, as a small M, you're breaking some No, no, but I just, I, it's worth making the point. So okay. uh, yeah, I think it is. It's, uh, what I'm really saying is that, you know, once you get past about 1870, 1880, we start to get waves of immigration, Northern Irish, Protestants, English, rise of the British Empire, a whole, and they come very self-confident with the empire behind them. A lot of people have written about the racism that comes from Europe at that point. And they start imposing on the surface of the Canadian debate a kind of European-derived idea of the country. And then the French respond to that. We get a French idea of, uh, of a part of the country. And, uh, and more and more you hear this thing, you know, Canada's more European than the States, right? Well, of course, it's complete nonsense. I mean, the United States is the single remaining European country. It was, you know, built out of the Enlightenment, and 19th century nationalism, all their documents. The melting pot is a European idea of a monolithic race, right? And uh, it's, it's the child of Europe. We, on the other hand, if you look at everything that we do, everything that we do that works, you can't find roots in Europe. Well, let's it. go through a checklist. What makes us a particularly Métis culture or well, heritage? Well, you know, for a start, uh, and I think this is one of the most important things, is you know, since Confederation in, in, in political strife, we've killed about, I don't know, 85 people or so in political strife. Uh, and uh, that's a very small number. Small number. number. Yeah. And you ask yourself, well, how do we do that? Why do we do that? Uh, in spite of racism and all the rest of it. And one of the reasons seems to be that we are quite good at dealing with complexity, living with it, endless negotiation, endless talking. We're still talking about our bloody constitution 160 years later or whatever. And where does that come from? Certainly not European. That, all those European states in the United States are all about clarity, elimination, killing, killing mm -hmm. as a result, large amount of killing instead of talking. And you go back and you realize that the, what, what the Europeans found here were two million people c belonging to very large number of different nations, quite different from each other as civilizations, who'd figured out most of the time ways of not killing each other. Not all the time, most of the time. And negotiating, talking. And they had various mechanisms for doing that. Uh, the way they came together, the way they met. Not racially based approach, but rather community, family, geographic race uh, based approach. Um, you, this should sound familiar. This sounds like Canada today. Uh, they had all sorts of ways of dealing with outsiders coming in without having a big fit that they weren't, you know, the perfect little Englishman or the perfect little Frenchman. Um, they had ways of redefining the family. Well, let me follow up on that, yeah. because you do talk about intermarriage in the book between Aboriginals and European settlers. Are you suggesting that Canadians, in some respects today, carry native sensibilities in our DNA? Uh, that's a difficult question, in our DNA. I don't know that I know how to define DNA in order to answer G that given question. The, given, the, given the significant amount of intermarriage that took place in this country one, two hundred years ago. Yeah, well, there's no question that there was an enormous amount of intermarriage from the beginning. I mean, you know, Champlain said right away, he realized what a weak position. He said, our, men are, our young men are going to marry your young women, and we are going to da 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 And the Hudson's Bay Company had in its first half of its history a policy, which was these young, poverty-stricken, not very well-educated Scots who arrived were to try to negotiate a marriage with the daughter of a chief to learn how to eat, to live decently, to have decent clothes, and to get into a trading network. And that's gone on in different places, in different ways, in spite of 100 years of pretty bad racism. Uh, it's gone on all over Canada and continues to go on. And I, and I think what's interesting is that today in this very complicated, racially complicated society that we have, you see the new statistics on intermarriage between communities and racial groups. They're fabulous. 
I mean, but your point is we've been doing it for hundreds we, of years. The point already. is it didn't come from nowhere. Most people think that what we call multiculturalism appeared out of Pierre Trudeau's back pocket somewhere in the 1970s. And but in fact, it, no, in fact, Pierre Trudeau wasn't Napoleon, and we didn't change overnight. Uh, he improved things in that area, but we were picking up on the. the I think let's instead of DNA, let's call it the collective unconscious. Following up on that. Here's <laughs> and I think we've got 400 years of the collective unconscious building up, and it was about intermarriage, different people living together, talking to each other, and so on. Okay, here's a quote on that. No matter how unconscious we have been of our origin, we have continued, you say, to act upon the basis of our original foundation, even if we have been unable to explain how we have come to put fairness and inclusion first in our self-image. I want to try to get how this works. Where do we inherit ideas without knowing where they are and where they are from? You know, you're living in a really um, utilitarian era, and everything's supposed to be measurable. Right? I mean, this is what they teach them now. You know, you know the, 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 the consultants and the, the economists and this, even the social science, all about charts and graphs. Of course, when you do it that way, you can't have a democracy. Because what you end up with is a democracy based simply on self-interest. And you measure all the self-interest, and that's how they vote, and that's how you run the society. And that's actually pretty close to Mussoliniism, really. Balancing competing self-interest? Yeah, that's Mussolini. Okay. Yeah, it's called corporatism. Uh, you just take away the uniform forms and the racism and the silly marches and so on. And it's, it's basically the theory of corporatism of the 1930s. Uh, on the other hand, if you have to believe there's something called the collective unconscious in order to believe you live in a civilization or society. And that's what happens after a couple of hundred years. Is people get used to doing things a certain way. Some of it they get right, some of it they get wrong. If you're lucky, you keep correcting what's wrong as opposed to correcting badly what's right. And I think that in a funny kind of way, we haven't had the language, but we've had these good moments when we are able to act as if we, we, we instinctively understood what was right, even if we couldn't quite explain it. And the reason we can't quite explain it is because we're so convinced we have to use European, American-derived language to explain what we do. How can you explain single-tier health care using imported language when we're the only Western country with single-tier health care? You know, just to take a single mm -hmm. example, how can you explain but you endlessly... Would say hmm? You would say that's a, that's a kind of a Métis characteristic, yeah, the fact that I would we're single-tier instead of two-tier. Yeah, I would say it's something that comes out of the very interesting idea of egalitarianism that existed in and exists in Aboriginal traditions and societies. What the fascinating thing about this book is as soon as I started talking to people about it, just people, you know, they'd say, that's it. I mean, I've never seen since Voltaire's Bastards people respond so fast to the concepts that, that it's as if, as they, uh, people often say, you know, I've always thought that, but I didn't know how to say it. And writers' jobs to figure out how to say things, mm -hmm. right? There have been the other side of the equation, too. We'll get to those a little bit later. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I, I hear what you're other saying. Other side of the equation in terms of? In terms of some people saying you're trying to redefine our history in a way that they don't accept and they think you're just wrong. But we'll get to that. Yeah. Well, okay. So far, I've been quite interested to see that there haven't been too many people saying Not that. too many. <laughs> yeah, no. We'll, we'll get, I expected a lot more. Life would not be interesting if there weren't a few, yeah. right? Okay. Does it not, uh, talk to us again a little bit more about this, because we don't have the written history in the way we do from Europeans, for Aboriginals, well, I think. Yeah, it's, it's more oral, is it not? Well, it's oral, but I mean, the point is, you know, Europeans arrived, a big variety of Europeans arrived, and they found this very strong, healthy, complicated civilization which has many differences in it. And for a long time, they heard about that. They listened to that. They were helped by that. There's a very clear understanding, if you look at Canadian history, of what that conversation was like. You look at the Great Peace of Montreal, 1701, uh, the Peace of Niagara, 1764, really the foundations, I think, of modern Canada in many ways. They knew, the Europeans knew exactly what the ideas were and how things worked. I mean, concepts like um, eating from the, the common bowl, we will all eat from the common bowl. It's a, concepts of egalitarianism and inclusion. Healthcare. Mm, there's your single tier health care. And, and they're in many of the legal Western, uh, uh, Western written down documents. There are all those, those Aboriginal phrases in their different forms, you know? It's, it, so, so I think that we have a pretty good idea of what's there, what was there, and what is there. Because remember, unlike Europe, where things like that were broken and buried, um, it's never been broken in Canada. An attempt was made to break it, or many attempts were made to break it. 
but it is very much alive and well. And we've gone from under 200,000 back up to 1.2 million. We'll soon be at 2 million, thank God. They're the fastest growing demographic. Yeah, thank God. You know, I mean, I say this very, because so many, as part of the old colonial stuff, the continuation, people can you say, oh, what are we going to do? Isn't it sad? No. Whereas, in fact, this is a fabulous opportunity that we're getting a second chance to work with the founding principles, the founding structures of the country because the basis of the country, the Aboriginals, are making a big comeback. And this is a fabulous opportunity for us, not some heavy burden to be borne. It's a positive. Another excerpt. Why do we continue, you say, to stumble and resist and deny when it comes to this Aboriginal role in Canada? The most obvious answer is that we don't know what to do with the least palatable part of the settler story. We wanted the land. It belonged to someone else. We took it. Idealized or not, Aboriginal populations have been decimated. You've just pointed that out. To what extent do you think it is part of our collective unconscious, this whole thing? How does it affect what us? What do you mean? Which part? How does uh, it affect us, the fact that the population has been so decimated over the years? Well, I mean, there's no question that, that, um, that having adopted this sort of European talk and having taken the land and having been the cause of, consciously or unconsciously, the cause of the death of so many, so, so, you know, the decimation of that population, that, you know, we've never really dealt with that. And, of course, you know, an apology is a good thing in terms of the schooling and so on. You like that? Well, the apology was fine. Okay. That, that was a good thing to do. Okay. Absolutely. But the, the apology is dealing with, with part of what was done wrong. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the enormous positive weight and influence that comes from the Aboriginal side. It's the opposite of this, of that, not the opposite, it's the other side of that. And we stand, frankly, to gain enormously of this as a civilization by admitting the, the strength that comes from that side. And we, I think we can't get at it in part because we'd have to deal with the fact that we simply took the land. And, you know, the Supreme Court made a series of decisions over the last, what, 10, 15 years, Delgamut and so on. Every time the Supreme Court makes a major decision, they basically come down on the side of First Nations Aboriginals, pretty well every time. Uh, the the, the Delgamut is fascinating because basically the government of Canada went and said, here's the treaty, here's the written law, here's what we did, etc. And the Aboriginals came and said, here's the oral memory, here's what we said. We repeated it very openly and in public. And the Supreme Court said, actually, we believe the oral, oral over the written. written. Yes. Now, the fascinating thing about that <coughs> is that is a possible revolution in the way to think about Canada. Hmm. It opens us up completely to rethinking ourselves, getting away from the, the, the theory of the, of the letter of the law towards the principles of the law. But I can't, can't and, I and we're afraid to go in it. The lawyers are just sitting there afraid to push Dalgamut further, when in fact it's a great opportunity for the country. Let me go off the path a little bit here, and that is that to, to Mr. and Mrs. Everyday Canada, if you like, who will listen to what you just said about how this is a wonderful opportunity given the you know, burgeoning demographic of uh, First Nations births nowadays. And their vision of the First Nations of this country today is poverty, suicide, alcoholism, terrible health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Can you tell them why you think it's a good thing that First Nations are growing so quickly? Well, there's, there's several things there. The first thing is that I think the new racism in Canada, the new way of being racist towards Aboriginals, is to constantly concentrate solely on those things. It's not that they don't exist. It's not that these problems don't exist. But there is virt and I'm not doing the kind of why don't we say something nice argument. It's, it's, it's that it's virtually never mentioned, the Aboriginals are virtually never mentioned, except in the context of isn't it sad, isn't it terrible, right? But they, but they but, do a lot of that as well. When in their yes. dealings with government, they yes, do that. Yes, they do. But but the point is, it's if you are a Canadian citizen who isn't in it, doesn't know a lot about this, and maybe lives in Toronto, so doesn't or lives in Vancouver, you'd know more. Let's say Toronto, Montreal, you wouldn't necessarily know that much uh, because you wouldn't have many contacts. Um, that's all you hear. So if I say to you that you know, and I've been in I don't know half the Inuit communities, I've been in Aboriginal communities across the country for decades, and I'm not the greatest expert. You know, there are lots of people who know more than I do, for a start, all the Aboriginals, right? But um, uh, if I say to you, uh, if you ask me, well, so name some of the great leaders in Canada today, well, I'd say, well, 
you know, Joseph Gosnell might come up there in the first two or three, you know, the he former head of the Nishka, and then I'd, Guja, the head of the Haida, would definitely be up there in the top ten. And I'd just start going, you know, uh, Phil Fontaine, obviously, is one of the most interesting leaders in Canada. Uh, where would I put him in comparison with the last two or three Canadian cabinets? Well, I'd put him up in the top two or three people, I'd put totaling, totaling all of those cabinets, you know. I'd put Ted Nolan on that list. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole list of people. And then, you, you know, I look at, uh, I look at the young, young Aboriginals. Um, you know, it's, if I say to you, I mean, it's obviously a loaded question, right? <laughs> you know, how many Aboriginals are in post-secondary edu uh, education in Saskatchewan? What is the total number? Yeah. I haven't a clue. You haven't a clue. And if I hadn't asked the question and you'd just volunteered it, most Canadians would say, well, a couple of hundred or something like that, because that's what they imagine, right? Well, I think it's seven or 8,000, right? Uh, you know, University of Manitoba, over 1,000 uh, Aboriginals come out of the access program. You look around, I'm meeting all the time people in their 20s, ab young Aboriginal leaders. And that's leaders. where the focus should be? No, I'm just saying, if you want to look at this, yes, there are some real problems, but yes, there are fabulous things happening, really interesting people with really interesting ideas and we're not listening and in fact we're not even asking them to tell us what they're thinking. Instead of that we're saying, isn't it a pity? Isn't it sad? In fact, these people are dying to talk about what they think could be done. They have some really interesting ideas for themselves but also for the whole of the country. Why do you think the first 250 years tell a deeper truth about who we are more so than the last 200 years which provide us, I think it's fair to say, with far more vivid examples about why we became urban and industrial and science-based, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's not exactly what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the first 250 years give you a sense, because of the, 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 the strength of the Aboriginal populations at the time, give you uh, a sense of how we, how we put the place together and what ideas were adopted and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, used in order to form the, the foundation of the country. No other country that I know of has any problem with the idea that the origins of the country are absolutely essential to what we do today. The United States doesn't have a problem with that. Britain doesn't have a problem with that. France certainly doesn't. Germany, Italy, Spain. But we do. But we spend our whole time pretending that it's all about today. Well, I'm sorry. Not about we, today, but the last 150 years. No, no, but then, then what I'm saying is that we had 100 years where we did many interesting things, many interesting things, but we also did, we have also obscured the first 250 years and did some really unfortunate things, which you can list, I can list, we can all list, you know, and we don't need to go through the racism and the exclusion and stuff like that. Uh, not just to Aboriginals, right? And then I think one could say another hundred years where we've been pulling ourselves back together again in a way and trying to put the pieces back together and we've become a really interesting country. But this interesting country is not being able to do what it wants to do to a great extent because it can't explain itself to itself. And that's because it's cut itself off from those first 250 years. So we can't even explain single-tier health care to ourselves. We can't explain. You know, we sort of have this ridiculous argument, well, are you for peacekeeping? Are you for warriors? I mean, this is so sort of comic book, you know? We, we can't actually say, well, actually, you know, we started out with a peacekeeping idea, and it evolved from incident to incident and engagement to engagement. There were big, big changes, and, you know, well, we were in the ex-Yugoslavia and so on. And, and why can't we have that conversation? We can't have it because we're importing the language. We're not using the language which is relevant to this place. Well, let me follow up on that then. If, if we do reintegrate this Aboriginal reality, if, right. we, if we accept right. it, if we begin this conversation you want us to have, how would that change us? If you, first of all, start by saying the real basis of the country is Aboriginal. Secondly, you, get, you stop, get off this defensive position. That, that most of Canada is on, S get rid of the problems really fast, the, the, the technical problems like the treaties. Now we can start talking about positive things. And I think you would be surprised at the release of energy that would come in the country if we stopped wasting everybody's time holding back on these issues. We're, we're still dealing th with them in a late 19th century manner. We just have politer ways of talking about it. I have no sympathy for the way in which these negotiations are not being done properly. But let me just hit on this again. I mean, responsible government is kind of a white man's thing, wouldn't you agree? And if you want to have aboriginal input into responsible government, provincial parliament, parliament, the way we have it laid out right now. I don't actually think that. It, it's no? a good question, but I don't think I actually agree. I mean, the way in which we do democracy, and this is one of the things I'm saying, of course there are things you can recognize as being, you know, British parliamentary democracy mm -hmm. and whatever, but actually, when I go to Britain and look at the way they run their democracy, it isn't the way we run our democracy at all. No, so what, what we use the terms, but I'm not at all convinced that the way we're doing it is all that European. 
And I think you'd find that if we actually relaxed, got some of these things out of the way, changed our attitudes, you'd find that we would understand our own democratic system a lot better. We'd realize it is our own democratic system, that it actually has these peculiarities. If our system is so European, so white guy, as you said, but I mean, so European, then how is it that every time I'm in Europe trying to explain our immigration and citizenship policies, they have no idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> and, and actually, now that I've written this book and I've thought about it, I'm going to go back and say it in a very different way. I'm going to start saying, the reason we can do it and you can't do it is the basis of our immigration citizenship policy actually lies in North America with First Nations, with Aboriginal. Mm -hmm. And that, that allowed us to get out of your racial based approach towards citizenship, which you're still struggling with. That's why we can have 1% of our population a year come in, 85% become citizens within five years, and it's going reasonably well in spite of a lot of cutbacks. It's going reasonably well. In the United States, it's 40%. Europe, it's mm -hmm. about 6%, and they're having conniptions. And we're way up. Yeah. Uh, let's, I've got a couple of minutes left here. A couple of minutes left. My, the time flies when, yeah, you, when well. you're in rhetorical <laughs> flight, John <laughs> Ralston Saul. I'm sorry. No, it's good. It's good. I'm enjoying it. You praise the aboriginals for their idea of eating from the common bowl. You referred to that already. And I want to know how different that is from the European ideal of social democracy, where the concern is for public responsibility, the common will, and so on. Well, you know, there are a lot of things shared around the world. We could easily pull in Buddha and you know, Confucius and pull them in. And they're, you know, great ideas have their basis at the heart of uh, ethical philosophies all around the world. So then you look at, well, how did they do that there? The idea of justice exists everywhere. You know, I've always said you can take you know, the, the, the 20 greatest lines from, from Christ, from Confucius, from Mohammed, and, they all uh, and I put them in a, in, a, in a thing and with a hat and say, okay, where's this from? And everybody will get it wrong, right? Yeah. So, so that, that's not what we're talking about. I, I think that there, is, um, uh, there are elements in the uh, Aboriginal approach uh, towards the common bowl you know, as I said, not racially based. Very interesting difference from European social democracy, which came out of nation states which were racially based, right? Mm -hmm. So there, in other words, the social democracy is happening at the same time that they're eliminating minorities and minority languages mm -hmm. and coming up with a monolithic mythology. Very different situation. That's why, you know, the, the idea that gr the group and the individual can be balanced in Canada, it's a very basic Canadian idea. Mm -hmm. In the United States, this is anathema. That's the difference between the right and the left. Or in Europe, this is the big battle between the left and the right. So yes, social democracy is something that we can all understand. But the, the form of the social democracy, the roots of the social democracy, can be quite different. I want to get two more things in. Have you had responses from First Nations to this book? Yeah, well, the book's only been out a week. And exactly. I've, already, I've already had letters, phone calls, people saying interesting positive, things. Positive, negative, what? Oh, so far, positive. Positive. Yeah. They accept your interpretation. Well, they, don't, they don't need to accept my I mean, I'm, you know, they don't need me. No, no, they, no, no. I mean, but, they don't need but you know, I know a lot of these people. Do I they mean, appreciate what you're trying to do? I wouldn't put it that way either. I think it's part of a conversation, and I think people are happy to see a conversation taking place. There, I think a lot of people, Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal, are interested to see that a guy like me is willing to carry this discussion into the public place. I knew you'd be disappointed if I didn't, as I promised several minutes ago put one example of someone who wasn't so thrilled with what you were trying to do oh, on yes. the record here. Oh, yes. Who is here. this? This is Jonathan Kay from the National Post. Oh, I don't yes, know if you saw yeah. this. Let's, let me just read the excerpt quickly. I'm going <laughs> to beg I, the I, control room for a little more time here as I go through this. The question of how exactly a bunch of warring, preliterate, aboriginal hunter-gatherer societies could claim credit for the creation of a modern, democratic, capitalist, industrial powerhouse built entirely in a European image is one that, alas, I must leave for others, says John Kay. That's because I could not get past Saul's ridiculous introduction in which he claims that white liberal sympathy and guilt regarding the plight of Canada's natives are merely manifestations of, you guessed it, racism. You get a chance to respond. Well, there's nothing to respond. I mean, I think it speaks for itself. And Mr. K is clearly part of the problem, not part of the solution. You know, I mean, I'm actually amazed, frankly, that uh, there used to be something called a page editor who looked at stuff and said, you know, that actually is not the sort of thing we print in the newspaper. I mean, I'm not going to go too far, but I mean, that is clearly the kind of language which is, it's not, that's not opinion. Is it racist? What do you think? I'm asking you. Well, you I wrote think, the book. I, well, ask, ask your readers, what they, your listeners, what they think. I mean, I think that kind of uh, uh, monolithic typification, insulting of, of an enormously broad and complex civilization is 
pretty surprising. I think I'd, yeah, I think I'd probably call it racism. And, and the interesting thing is it's completely, of course, un, like most racism, it's ridiculous and inaccurate. You know, it, it, it doesn't even get his historical levels right. You know, he doesn't even know his history. It's, it's embarrassing, actually, to think that someone like that has a public platform. But, you know, it's free, free country. It's and a free country. It's a free country, and so be it. One last thing here. The subtitle of your book is Telling Truths About Canada. And you, as a good sort of critical, skeptical observer of all that we are, was there a little piece of you that was nervous about putting the word truth? Yeah, but the, in whole, the whole title is filled. You know, uh, um, uh, a fair country. Of course, fair means, in English, means uh, being fair. Uh, being beautiful, being middling, you know, so it has three meanings right there. Okay. The whole title, and, and telling truths, telling means are these, are you, am I telling it? Or are these, or are these revealing? Telling. You yeah. know, it's so, okay. I mean, the whole title is filled with, and truths, by the time you get to the word truths, you realize that there's a lot of irony in the way I'm constructing it. We had to do the same thing in French, and it's very complicated. We changed it completely. Look, it's a fascinating book, and you've done a service to the country by writing this, and even if not everybody agrees with it, it is a fascinating read. Well, I hope not everybody agrees with it, but can, I really feel that it's time to have this discussion, and I'm thrilled to be part of it. And we're glad you came in to tell us about it today. John Ralston Saul, a fair country, and a pretty fair interview, too. Thank you very much.